Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this uh, episode of Friday Night Hangouts. And we have a, a few saints that uh, gathered together here for fellowship and to discuss the scriptures together. Uh, the topic that we're beginning tonight uh, is a new topic, and it'll prob probably require at least several episodes to get through this subject. Uh, the title that we chose, uh, Sister Lisa Harang came up with the idea. I asked people to give me an idea for a title, and she said you should call it uh, Probation versus Salvation. And I love the idea, but I wanted to uh, use um, add something else to it because uh, to make it contemporary. So I we're going to call this show uh, MacArthur. Piper and Washer versus John, Paul, and Peter. So we're going to compare the teachings of these modern-day uh, Pharisees, these Lordship Salvation teachers, MacArthur, Piper, and Washer. Uh, we're going to compare what they teach today uh, with what uh, the apostles taught. Uh, and so we invite you, if you're watching now live, if you have any verses that have bothered you, that uh, confuse you, that you you think uh, you wish you had an explanation because it makes you wonder if salvation is a free gift or if you have to somehow work for it, or if you're afraid somehow you might lose your salvation for any reason because of any particular verses, then send us those verses and we're going to... Uh, explain them uh, to you tonight. Uh, now, first I want to kind of lay a foundation for this. So I've, t I've been preparing all week to the outline for the show. So let me start off by saying this. Uh, what we really want to answer is this question is, are there contradictions in the Bible? On one hand, we know that Scripture says, that you get salvation through faith alone and you can never lose your salvation. And on the other hand, we have verses they no, you lose it. Uh, you froze up, Luke. On my end, anyway. I, Luke, maybe your bandwidth's high. Dead air, oh no. <laughs> I hear a TV. Mm. Not mine, but somebody's uh, listening to an advertisement about memory foam, it sounds like. Uh, that's in the other room. <laughs> I can testify memory foam is wonderful. <laughs> Me, I'm just a minimalist, so I just go for anything. <laughs> Sticks and twigs and hay, huh? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> right on. So do you guys have uh, YouTube channels, too? Uh, I do. Um, What's your channel called? Uh, let me bring it up here real quickly. Um, If I can get it to change real quickly. It's called uh, Grace Not Works, the number four. Cool. I will sub to you. Mine is uh, Galaxy Dreams 3, Wayne. Okay. okay. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, I, I lost the connection. I don't know what point it went out as far as what's the last thing you heard me say, and then I'll try to pick it up from there. I'm back because I was I was gone. You you didn't even really get started before you cut out. Oh, did I announce the title? Uh, I think that's about as far as we got. Oh, oh wow! I heard you I say never... about um, you know, if anybody had any verses that were troubling them and they want to post them in the comments, okay. they can do that. That's about the last thing I remember. Uh, all right. Well, I had a practice run through on this foundation. I want to lay. I guess I'll just have to do it all over again here. Okay, so let me start now, and hopefully, I don't know what's wrong with the internet tonight, but it seemed like uh, I'm not the only one we're having difficulties. 
Okay, so let me start over here. Uh, I did explain the title, MacArthur, Piper, and Washer versus John, Peter, and Paul. Okay. Yes. And, and the idea that these modern-day teachers here are teaching that uh, you're, you're really on probation. You, you better behave yourself or you could lose your salvation. And, and uh, uh, the, the apostles taught, no, salvation is a gift and you don't have to worry about losing it. So that's, that's the basic idea. Now, uh, we're going to go over verses that uh, state that, you can, that salvation comes by faith alone and you cannot lose your salvation. And I'm asking anybody who's watching, and including the panelists, uh, if you have any verses that uh, have troubled you, uh, then send them in to us uh, if you think it, it, these verses uh, contradict salvation by faith alone and eternal security. And we will be glad to discuss them. That's the point of the show tonight. We want to discuss those verses that are confusing everyone. Uh, but let me say this. I do not believe that the Bible contradicts itself. I don't believe that it says on one hand that you're saved by faith alone, and then on the other hand that no, faith is not enough, works are also required. That would be a clear contradiction. Um, so, but, so how do you know the truth? Uh, I, I am putting this idea forward. Uh, can you guys still hear me okay? Yes, sir. Yes, I hear you. Okay, I didn't want to be lost again. Okay, this is the premise I'm laying forward, then I want the panel to respond to this. I'm stating that the foundation of our understanding must be established by the clear texts that require no interpretation, not by the unclear, confusing, and controversial texts that do require interpretation. Another way of looking at this is the question, which is more reliable, trying to find the truth by solving a riddle or by hearing a simple declarative statement of the truth? Okay, so I'm going to ask the panelists to, to respond just to that idea. And uh, rather than calling on you, whoever starts talking first gets to speak first. Well, a, a riddle is not very straightforward. I would say uh, that that's not, that's not the easiest to understand. Isn't that what you asked, if, if a riddle yeah. was easier to understand or something more straightforward? Yeah, yeah. In other words, if we wanted to really understand something, are we better off trying to learn it through a riddle, well, or are we better off just having the tr this truth simply stated without any uh, any riddle? I think tr people try and make riddles out of things that are straightforward. You know, I don't. I, I, I think the I personally think that everything in the Bible leads to um, you know that God's that God will never leave us, never never forsake us. It says in in Hebrews. I mean, there's a lot of things in there that. I don't even know. I mean, the scriptures that I used I used to believe that every time I sinned, I lose my salvation. I grew up in a, a Pentecostal church, and um, you know, I was all about you know, if if I sin and Jesus comes back, I'm missing the rapture. So <laughs> that's how I grew up, and so I've had a lot of changes. And for a while, I um, I saw every scripture talking basically led to conditional salvation, and once I Really, you see the scripture from from your own scope of what you believe. Uh, I believe a lot of people do that. If somebody believes a way, then the scripture is going to lead to them uh, lead to a different conclusion to them. That's why we need a. That's why we need to be uh, exegetical in our studies and really get to what it really says. It, it sounds to me what you're saying really in a roundabout way is that over time you you've come to the. Um, conclusion that you do understand the verses that have confused you in the past and normally confuse other people but you're no longer confused it seems all clear-cut to you there in other words I'm saying there are clear verses and there are confusing verses but you've reached the point that you're no longer confused by the confusing verses well I've dealt with them um, I had to I mean I'm a pastor and people ask me about these things a lot um, I, I've had to I've had to deal with these things but whenever like I said, whenever someone believes a certain way, everything's going to be filtered through their belief unless they are objective in their studies. And that's why I changed. I actually I grew up believing a certain way because I was taught that way. And so everything I read, I had to defend it somehow based according to whatever I've been taught. And then when you study the, the Word, you study 
you study that um, from the context of who God is and uh, God's character and just the the way the the um, apostles uh, the way they saw God then you get a totally different message than that of um, of the Holiness Pentecostal Church. All right, uh, I'd like anybody else who wants to respond to my premise uh, before we go any further. Uh, Brother Luke, what was it about riddles? The, pr the premise is, is this. Do you, it, which is preferable? Do you want to learn your truth by, by trying to sort out a riddle? Or would you rather learn your truth and base your understanding on a truth because of a clear-cut, um, simple teaching? Uh, clear-cut, simple teaching. Yeah. And Matthew, are you still there? Okay. I think that uh, I think that we can all agree. It certainly is a lot better, a safer, and more uh, probably a, a lot more dependable to be able to get our truth from the clear verses rather than the confusing ones. Okay. Absolutely. So um, now, so the, the here's the next question we need to address. Is, a sal is salvation attained by faith, or is it attained by works, or is it attained by some combination of faith and works? Uh, we're going to be going over verses that, to answer this question, but these are basically the only options I can see. Can anybody see any other any options other than universalism? We're not going to get into that, I guess, but uh, the idea of is... Uh, you can you have to work to earn your salvation, or it's just a free gift. Works are not part of it, or there's some combination of faith and works. Are there any other options? Because these are the only three that I I can see in the scriptures. Uh, Brother Luke, is obedience considered a work? Yeah. Okay, then that yeah, I would My say opinion that is. those are the top three. Yeah. Okay. Inclusionism is a little different than universalism. Inclusionism says that uh, everybody's saved and some people will get kicked out. Universalism says that everybody will be saved. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of inclusionism. See, all these years of studying and all these years on YouTube, now I have a new term that I've never heard before. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> okay. I don't know who teaches it. I just, uh, I've just heard it, and I've heard it subtly in a lot of different teachings. And I've had to look it up to find out why people were saying that, and that's what it's called. I'm reading a book right now called "The Gospel in Ten Words," and he's talking about that. Um, no, he's not a proponent of it. He's a proponent of the gospel, saved by grace alone. But, um, but he was talking about different views of soteriology. And uh, that was one of them he, that he had mentioned. Oh, okay. Okay, let me connect the two points I've made so far here together. Uh, on one, one hand, I'm laying this as a foundational truth for our study. And that is that our understanding must be established by the clear texts that require no interpretation, not by the unclear, confusing, and controversial texts that do require interpretation. Uh, that's point number one. I think we've nobody's dissented on that. We all seem to agree on that. That you're, it's wise to put your faith in what's clear instead of trying to fit, put your faith in something that's uh, controversial and, and uh, requires everybody's individual interpretation. Then the other question is: Okay, uh, if we take that as our uh, position, then is salvation attained by faith or works or a combination? So the first thing I want to do is I want to Clear, through a clear text, eliminate one of these three options. Faith, works, or a combination. Let's eliminate it with one verse. Let's go to Romans 11, 5 and 6. I guess this would be two views verses. Uh, it says, So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, Grace would no longer be grace. And the term that I 
included on this, uh, not that I want to add to scripture, but what this is really saying is that grace and works are mutually exclusive. You cannot have them together. It's either one or it's the other. Once you try to combine them, then they're nullified and it's neither one. Okay, so can, uh, what does everybody think of that verse? And do you think that that verse uh, satisfactorily nullifies the whole idea that somehow faith and works are together are required? Well, you don't build... One thing I learned is that you don't build any doctrine just based on one scripture. Um, so I think we just need to look at... Uh, well, uh, let me read it again. Romans eleven five and six is what we're reading. Uh, yeah. So too, now, got, the... we got a lot more verses to go. Okay. But as far as I'm concerned, this particular verse is almost as though Paul was asked the same question we're asking right now. Imagine someone asking the Apostle Paul, Paul, are we saved by faith or works or some combination of faith and works? And Paul would say, Well, you, it's either grace or it's works. It cannot be both because you can't mix them. They're nullified if you try to mix them together. So forget that right off the bat is what he says. Right. Well, I think uh, it's pretty straightforward. That's, this is what I want to ask you on every verse we go through. Let's just t everybody take a vote, a vote on this. Not like voting makes it correct or not. But does everybody agree that this is a clear verse? Or is this a verse that would require interpretation? Are we? Is anybody on the panel here going to take that verse and and uh, think it means something other than that? Uh, it's grace and works cannot be mixed. You have to choose. It's either grace or works because once you put them together, it's neither one. Does anybody think that it means anything besides that? Because that's what it says. That's exactly what it says. So not only is it is it clear that it's by grace not works it says that if it were by any other way besides grace then it wouldn't work you know it, it nullifies the other options altogether so I'll, that's I yeah. like that verse for that reason that's in a way it's a like purity uh, you have pure grace and you have pure works okay but when you try to make it a combination it, it becomes neither one because the purity of grace is nullified it's it's no longer grace because you've made it dirty you dirtied it up with works if it was purely by works then you can't say it grace has anything to do with it because then you've made it no longer by works so Paul uh, it's almost like this very question was asked to Paul and that's his answer so in my opinion uh, now, we're going to go over a lot more verses that make this even, uh, answer it even uh, reinforces this answer. But as far as I'm concerned, this one verse settles the issue to me. It's that clear that uh, it, it cannot be a combination of faith and works. So people can, if you're watching now, you can get saved. If you want to try to get saved by your works, but you have to be perfect because uh, James says that uh, uh, if, you, if you're, Err in one point, then you're guilty of all. So, in other words, you have to follow every law, every commandment, every you've never sinned one time. Otherwise, if you sin even once, you're a sinner and you're disqualified. So, in other words, the you would have to be perfect if you want to get in by works. Okay. Uh, now, from as for me, knowing that I can't meet that standard, I say thank you, Jesus, for dying for me, and and because you're gracious, I can be saved. I, I'm I'm relying on that grace because I understand that I, I cannot meet the standard of the law and, and of perfection. Amen. Now, you guys, uh, if you even want to elaborate on that before I go on. Okay. Uh, here's another verse, and each time, as I said, I want anybody to say if you think it's clear or if this is one of the verses that could be controversial and require interpretation. The next verse we're going to look at is Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the, the question here is, not only what does it say, but is it clear? Is anybody going to be confused on this verse, or is it really one of these clear verses that is not controversial, that everybody says, that's what it says, that's what it means? 
I just have one thing to add to this that usually a lot of people put out there. They say you're not saved by your works, but they think that uh, this is a teaching I hold to. They think that turning from sin is not considered a work, uh, and they say that yeah, you're not saved by like doing charitable things or good, good tidings and good works. But they think that turning from sin isn't counted as a work, so that fits in there. I just wanted to read from uh, Old Testament. It's called uh, Jonah three ten. And it basically reinforces this statement of that uh, turning from sin is actually considered a work. Uh, it says, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. So it's already hinting that turning from sin is counted as a work because it's your own efforts. And then it says, and God repented of the evil. Now I also find this fascinating because most people get they love the word repent because they say repent means to turn away or to uh, to stop doing something. I like how it I like how it even says God repented of the evil, and we know that God never committed evil, so we know that instead of him turning away from the evil, it's it's like he changed his mind about it because it says in the next statement that he said he would do unto them and he did it not. So he was going to do something, but then he didn't do it. But he he wasn't in the act of doing it, though, so he necessarily wasn't turning away. He just had a change of mind. So I think that fits repentance of a change of mind. and also shows that turning from sin is also a work because it says, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. So absolutely, if, uh, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is wonderful. I just want to put out there that turning from sin is also a work. And we know that we're not saved by our works, so we also know that it is faith alone. Okay, Brother Austin, uh, I think that was an important addition because you're right. Some people try to wiggle their way out of this by saying, well, that's, it's like people I say, when it, the Bible says all this requires that you believe on the Lord Jesus and you're saved. And the people say, well, that depends on what believe means. You know, something like that. It's like something absurd, like somehow works. Uh, repenting of your sins and stopping sinning is not a work, you know. So I think you uh, you've certainly answered that very well with that scripture there. So the question, let us let us welcome Brother Jackson now. That's what the why I had to take that phone call <laughs> when we were talking here. Uh, he, for some reason, the email I sent to the, with the link, he didn't get it either. So <laughs> for now, uh, Brother Jackson, turn your volume down a little bit because it's uh, and then say hi. Um, let me try. Okay, we can hear you. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's very good. Okay. What about what about this volume? I can a hear little you. bit, a little bit lower, just a tiny bit. Okay, hang on, let me get some headphones. Yeah. Okay. All right. The volumes. So my the question was on Ephesians two eight and nine. If we have these two uh, two options. On one hand, you got clear verses that do not require interpretation. On the other hand, you have controversial verses that people are all interpreting differently. Which category does Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 fall in? Uh, certainly the clear, I would think. Okay. Uh, that's the foundation, Brother Jackson, that we laid at the beginning of the show. We're saying that a person is wise to, to put their faith in the verses that are clear that, are, that are, are simple and clear, that do not require any interpretation, rather than trying to put your faith in verses that are so controversial and everybody's debating what they mean. Okay? Right. So now we did Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 is the first one. And now let's discuss what it means. Uh, it says what it says. That's why I'm saying if it's a clear verse, you don't have to really interpret it. You can just read it, and we all agree. Right? Mm -hmm. But basically, if we're going to take it out of KJV and just say it in our own words, who wants to attempt to do that? Okay, Tanya, I just wanted to say one thing real quick. Um, not only are these two verses crystal clear, it doesn't take you know a lot of maneuvering to figure out what they're saying. It's very clear. But and and they both say that you're not saved by works. But then the verse also includes one a, a reason why you're not saved by works. Like the Romans 11, 5 and 6 says that, you know, if it were, then grace would no longer be grace. So that's a reason. And then in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, it is a gift of God, not of works. Why? Lest any man should boast. 
So I just think that's cool that it that it also gives a reason. It tells you that it's grace, and then it gives you a reason why it's not works. Mm hmm. Uh, should I use the word brilliant to describe her comment? Oh, absolutely. That's Am fine. I overdoing it? I know it's a very very good point. It, it declares something, and then after that, it even explains why. So so really, it's that's a very good point to understand that that uh, on on one hand, it's saying. It, 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 it's, it's got to be grace alone or works alone, and it, and it really is grace alone, but it can't be both. Uh, and then it goes on to say, and the reason why is that it would no longer be grace if you have mixed works in with it. Okay? And then on this one, it says, you're saved by faith, not by works. Uh, and it said, the reason why is if you could be saved by works, then you could be boasting to God. Actually, you could even say to God, uh, you could be at the judgment and say, God, you got to let me into heaven because of the works I did. You owe me. I earned it. You owe me. <laughs> yeah, actually, Hank Lindstrom made a similar point to that when he said if somebody actually did get to heaven by their works, nobody would ever hear the end of it, and they would just be <laughs> boasting and boasting and boasting and ruin everybody, ruining everybody's time. I remember that. Oh, I love that. That's funny. Yeah. yeah. I'd say Hank Lindstrom. I'd go back first to Curtis Hudson. Then Hank Lindstrom, then Yankee Arnold. That's kind of like they're all they're all buddies, and and uh, they they really are have a great tradition of really teaching this pure grace message. So you can't go wrong if you. Everybody watching now, I've got a playlist called Curtis Hudson, and uh, and then uh, brother Troy, he, his is TLW 1963. His channel, he posts a lot of Yankee Arnold's videos, so you can what get their uh, their sermons that way. All right, so let's go on now. Unless someone wants to talk more about Ephesians two eight nine, I'll go to the next verse. The next verse is um, uh, Romans three twenty seven twenty eight. Paul says, "Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith." Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So my first question is, which, oops, I accidentally clicked off my camera. My question is, on that verse, those verses there, on one hand you have clear verses, on the other hand you have controversial verses that people don't understand and, and argue over. Which, which group would that fall into? I wanted to apologize. I had my mute, um, sorry, my mic muted. I had one more thing to add on that works thing, and then it won't take long. I just was that. Uh, I like when Christ is at the uh, the judgment seat in Matthew twenty one through twenty uh, seven through twenty one twenty three. I'll just do uh, Matthew. 722, and many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? It's even referencing that people will think they're saved by their works, but as we as we just read, it's not by, by works. Yeah, th this, is, this is Jesus himself actually stating what I just posed, that could you imagine going to this judgment and boasting to God, look what I did in your name, I deserve it, you owe me. You know, okay. But now let's go on to this three uh, Romans three twenty seven twenty eight. First, let's let get. Is there anybody who believes this falls in the controversial sub category, where this these verses are easily misunderstood and everybody's going to and try to interpret their own way, or is this clear cut? And if it's so, I want someone to tell me in your own words exactly what Romans three twenty seven twenty eight means. I say this is absolutely clear cut. Uh, Very clear. It cuts out boasting, the no pride. It cuts out pride, is and it says by what law? It, it says the the law is not by of pride, is it of works? No, uh, but by the law of faith. So we even know what the it's we even know what the law is referencing. It's faith, and then therefore we conclude. So we know that a man is justified by faith. So we know that. He's absolutely justified by faith without deeds of the law. So, I mean, that's, I don't think you get any more straight cut than that. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing I would like to add to what Austin just said here, too, is 
I know some heretical people that try to say that, well, repenting of your sin or stopping a sin, that's not a deed of the law. A deed is like a positive thing or something, when really that's just flat absurd because there are more negative commands in the Old Testament. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, than there are positive commands. Therefore, very logically, I can conclude by not doing something God has told me not to do, that is a deed of the law. So I just wanted to put that out there as another argument for it actually being a clear verse. Yeah. Now, when people try to say, uh, wiggle out of these verses, that's what I used to call it, wiggling out, be because they're so clear, there's no other way you could you could interpret it. So, so what are they going to do? They try to wiggle out of it some way. Yeah, like redefine the word believe, like you were saying yeah. earlier. Okay. Um, yeah, or they'll bring up another verse so that is not clear. Okay, now I'm going to ask someone to take Ephesians, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Ro Romans 3, 27, 28, and in modern uh, Tennessee language or Ohio language, wherever you live, just rephrase it in your own words. So, you know, it's so simple. Tell us what it tell us what it says. Can we brag that we have done anything so that God will accept us? Um, it's it's not uh, it's because our, our our I guess we're not acquitted based upon obeying the law, but by faith alone. That's what I would say. Twenty seven says. Okay, the. One of the things I love about that verse is, is, is the final statement it says, therefore we conclude. So everybody watching now, if you think that works have anything to do with getting saved or staying saved, then what? Then this verse should be enough for you. This is Paul making a conclusion. So this is what we're hoping you, if you're watching now, you will come to this conclusion. Paul says, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, the way that I would rephrase that is, is it says, without, that means that's not part of it. So I would say, we conclude that a man is justified by faith alone. Amen. Faith alone. So if people ask you, where does in the Bible does it say you're justified by faith alone? I would say Romans 3.28 says that. Faith without the deeds of the law is faith alone. Okay. All right, uh, we'll go to the next one. Don't I don't want to rush through these. If anybody wants to talk any further about a verse before I go on, don't be shy, okay? I had one thing about the uh, the law. Most people uh, ask what the law is. Uh, we know that the law c uh, constituted a, a bunch of different things, but uh, later on, after uh, Christ's uh, burial resurrection, we know that in Galatians 5:14. Uh, for the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So we know that the law is completely summed up in just that one phrase that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now that's not to mean that uh, everyone has kept it. We've all broken nearly every single commandment or law indeed, but it's just to say that that's how simple the law is. So if anybody is wondering what that was, it's Galatians 5.14. Okay, I have a question for Tanya. Uh, you heard Austin's statement. Would you call that brilliant, Tanya? I would. Yeah, brilliant. That's very good because if people try to say, well, the law is specifically this, Brother Austin says, wait a second, Jesus said the law is this. It's summed up all in this one thing. Have you loved your neighbor as yourself? In other words, who's done that? We all have fallen short. I mean, have if for we have to always go up, come to our neighbor's need every time we are aware of it. And not only that, we'd have to go knocking on doors to find out if they have a need all the time. We'd have to be putting them uh, equal or ahead of ourselves at all times. I've never known a person who's like that. We're not, we're not capable of it. No, we're not. Because we're not God. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Austin. That was a very good point to make. And uh, now let's go to the next verse. Um, we're looking at Titus 3.5. It says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. So again, I ask the question. We're going to have two categories of verses. 
One category is clear that requires no interpretation. The other category is unclear, confusing, and controversial that people are all interpreting in a different way. And which category is this verse? Crystal clear. Crystal clear. Does anybody have any question about what that means? Uh, is it, could it possibly be meaning anything other than what it clearly states? So far, all these are pretty straightforward. Yeah. I just don't see how, when it says, okay, I'm going to ask someone else, though, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Someone step forward and tell me in uh, 2013 language what that says. I, I just have one thing to add to it. Uh, the reason why we're not saved by uh, see, I like these. I like these scriptures. You can always add on to them, uh, but it, but you add on to them with another simple scripture. It's just explaining it. I think that's the number one thing. I, I'll get to one more verse, but not right now. But uh, that's one thing about the word is that if we find a verse that's contradicting or confusing, the number one thing to understand that verse is another verse. We use the word of God to understand the word of God. Uh, and that's in Second Timothy 3.16 for correction and reproof and everything. But anyway, uh, the reason why we're not saved by our works of righteousness is in Isaiah 64.6. It says, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we do fade as a leaf, and our inequities like the wind have taken us away. So that right there says we could never be saved by our righteousness, because God views our righteousness as... Uh, as filthy rags. So that right there explains why it's not by our works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So that is referencing right there, Christ did all the saving and nothing on our part. Yeah, and another verse says that no one is righteous, no, not one. So anybody who does think they have their own personal righteousness is deceiving themselves, because the Bible says no one is righteous, not even one. Amen. That's uh, Romans 3.10. Okay. All right, so now I'm asking someone to take that verse and put it in uh, modern language, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. I did the last one. I know. So I'm giving someone else a... We have a shy, opportunity. We have a we have a shy panel tonight, Wayne. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. I'll do this with myself then. Okay. Um, not because of the good deeds, all the good acts that I've done in my life, but according, but only because God showed mercy on me. Okay. You know, I was sitting there looking at it, thinking, how how can I word this? It's so clear that I, I had to go through some trouble to try to word it differently. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you, know what that does? you know what that proves? It proves my basic premise, that there are some verses that are so clear, we don't need to try to figure out what it means or rephrase it. It's just that clear cut. And these are what we need to uh, rely upon instead of the verses we're going to take on later that many people are arguing about what it means. Okay. Well, I can I can tell you that uh, from a, a, a Pentecostal point of view, whenever you would read a scripture like this, uh, the the thought the the theology, even though it's not written on paper necessarily, but it's just the the zeitgeist, I guess, the the of the uh, Pentecostal church. I could talk on them because that's where I came from. Um, it's, you know, Jesus saved you up to the point you got saved. You know, all your sins, all your past sins were forgiven. And now, so Jesus is there for you, and he's there to, to, to uh, relate to you under grace as long as you're being good, but he relates to you under law as long as you're being bad. And so these scriptures are talking about you know, God's grace is there for you. You're saved because of God's grace only. But now that you're saved, here's what you got to do. And so that's that's where a lot. I don't know anything about MacArthur or any of those guys, so I don't know where they're where they where they would come from. But I, I know that's that's the the thought, and it doesn't make sense now. But there's a lot of people who would believe exactly what I just said. 
Yeah. Yeah, and then there is um, once you're saved, here's what you got to do. And if you're not doing it, then you're not saved. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Brother Wayne, right. based, on your, based on what you just said, for a second there, I thought that was John MacArthur talking. Uh, yeah. He believes this. I thought he was a, a Calvinist. Don't they believe once saved, always saved? Isn't that one no. of their. No, 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 no. I don't they know. Perseverance of the saints. No, they, be, they believe that if you're not performing, it proves that you're not one of the elect. Okay. Oh. And if you are one of the elect, you will, you know, change and stop sinning and you'll persevere to the end. That proves that you were one of the elect. Yeah. Okay. But really, what they're really saying is what you said in your statement that, look, Okay, you can get you can get saved uh, based upon this, but you better do your part after that, or you're not going to stay saved. But see, mm -hmm. what that point is, you've opened up a can of worms because that's what we're going to do in the second half of the show. We're going to get into losing salvation. Right now, we're, we want to stay focused on just this: uh, mm -hmm. on what does it take mm -hmm. to get saved? And and, when you're, and what then we're going to say: what does it mean to be saved? It means pa the word's past tense. <laughs> it's done. Okay. And uh, Wayne, to add on to what you just said, uh, the interesting thing is, I was talking to some people from this. It's, it's like International Churches of Christ. It's kind of it, it's one they believe in baptismal regeneration and everything. And when I kept on showing them the verses that we're going over right now, they kept on saying, "Well, well, let me give you an analogy." This guy kept kept on giving me these analogies that just kept on proving that he didn't really believe the gospel. If that makes sense, you know, he kept on one of his analogies. Well, he's like, "If my dad says he'll give me a car, but I have to mow the lawn," and he just I couldn't get over it, just over and over again. Every time I'd show him a verse, here would come another unbiblical analogy he would give. So that's just to reinforce what you just said. I think J Jesus gave a pretty good analogy with the uh, prodigal son. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Luke, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Okay, uh, I'm sorry everything was cutting off on my side, but I'd like to comment on this verse. Okay. Uh, before I got saved, you know, I memorized this verse. I believed you had to repent of your sins, and I believed a lot of that stuff. And, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't see at that point that you know, repenting of your sins was actually a work, you know, and so I was actually blinded to this verse, you know, according, you know, what the pastors have said, and I notice a lot of people will stick behind their denomination instead of seeing what the Bible says itself. I mean, you know, denomination ain't going to get you to heaven. It's what God says. Mm -hmm. That's I, blasphemy talk right there, sir. Yeah. <laughs> now, you, you know... Uh, Brother Matthew, you know that Brother Austin answered that question in the very, very beginning when he went back to the Old Testament and talked about uh, this, what repentance was turning away from your sins in the example he gave. So we, mm -hmm. we've, we've, Austin did an excellent job of refuting the mm -hmm. idea that repenting of your sin is not, uh, not a work. Mm -hmm. There is one thing that Brother Matthew said that I can add on to that makes uh, crystal sense to this. Okay. Uh, it's from Jesus Christ himself, and it's explaining to the MacArthur, Piper, Washter, Lordship crowd what they should do if they believe the doctrine they believe, and that is simply in John 5.39-5.40, through 540, Jesus Christ says, Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. So he's saying, okay, so based on your doctrine, based on your belief, you think you have eternal life. Well, he says, well, why don't you go search the scriptures because the scriptures will, you know, they will testify of the truth. They will refute your claim. And he also says, and they are which that which testify of me. And then in John 530, uh, John 540, it says, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. So he's explaining to them. You think you have your supposed eternal life, but you don't have any scripture to back it up. You just heard it from somebody else, and you never even came to the true gospel of salvation because I would give you life. And it's also offered there as a free kind of gift kind of thing. And ye not, and you will not come to me that ye might have life. It's not. There's no like you must repent of your sins or anything. It's just you know it's freely based. It's like a gift. So I think that, that John 5.39 is the best verse to use against not just the Lordship crowd, but any crowd that teaches a, another doctrine, another gospel, because it will the gospel will give clarity and uh, cut out all uncertainty to any uh, weird claims or gospels because the true gospel is crystal clear. 
Okay. Um, now, thank you. Would you read that verse one more time that you say is so important? I... Absolutely. It's uh, John 5.39 through John 5.40, and it says, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are which that testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Okay. All right. So I posed this question uh, at the beginning. I said, uh, we have to, we're asking the question, is salvation attained by faith, or is it attained by works, or is it attained by a combination of them? And uh, so far, we showed that you cannot mix the two, and therefore we moved on to the next point, and that's, well, then is it by works? And we showed in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it specifically says the words, not of works. Uh, Romans 3, 28 says, without the deeds of the law, we're saved. Uh, Titus 3, 5 says, not by works. Romans 4, 5 says, to him that worketh not, so uh, how many times do, uh, is it going to take before the truth hits someone over the head and they can see that the Bible says it's not by works, okay? Now, we're going to go on to Galatians 2.21. It says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Uh there's a, I think it's NIV or one of the modern translations says, I do not nullify the grace of God. Frustrate or nullify, uh, I like the idea of nullify. It makes it to me understand that, hey, it, it, it's, it, it, that you have no, uh, um, you have no grace if you, if you add law. It is not grace. This goes, it's kind of like a companion verse to the, to the one that we did in the beginning, uh, Romans 11, 5, and 6, it, it, it's saying that you've nullified it. It's no longer grace if you think it, it, righteousness comes by the law. Then Christ is dead in vain. Okay? Now, again, the question is, is this a clear verse? Is it? Does it require any interpretation, or is it, it, does everybody get it? Pretty clear to me. Okay. All right, and well, then we'll go on to this Galatians 5.4, and it says, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Okay? Another one that is saying that not only the one before it said Christ dead in vain, and this is another way of making the same point, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Jesus' death on the cross for your sins is, does you no good at all uh, if you think you're justified by the law. You do not have grace because you've nullified it. Anybody want to, I, I, the problem I'm having on these verses <laughs> is that it's hard to get you guys to even explain them because they're so clear that you, what can you, how can you explain them? Just read the verse, explains itself. Yeah, that's yeah, the, the, exactly the, it. the thing that amazes me is I've, um, I feel like I can't, I, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm getting mixed up here because I just, the only reason I question this memory is because it seems so incredibly absurd. But I feel like I remember somebody at some point saying frustrating the grace of God means like using the grace as a license to go out and sin or whatever or something like that. I'm, I, I have to question this memory just because that's so incredibly absurd to read Galatians 2.21 like that and well, think that. Well, that. That, would, that would contradict the point of the, next, the following phrase uh, if you think righteousness comes by law because that's saying, that's saying to the person, you think you're going to be righteous by following the law? Precisely. So it, it's making the exact opposite point, so it wouldn't fit in this case. Yeah, and that word, when I was looking at that verse, um, and I see that word frustrate, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Another word you can use besides frustrate is like agitate or irritate, you know, and that always happens when you're, when you're adding something to something. You know, say you have a cut on your hand or something like that, and you're like, touching it on stuff and getting dirt on it or putting something on it, it's going to frustrate it, it's going to agitate it, it's going to irritate it. So, you know, if you're adding works to grace, you, you know, you're frustrating it. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Um, 
I thought I put in my notes at some point. Uh, okay, I I mean I meant to say this as part of the introduction. Let me let me kind of back up at this point here. Um, I I have a video called uh, the challenge, and uh, then I ended up making challenge part two because there were, I found one person that actually did take the challenge. But I had this video up, the challenge up for a long time and no one would actually do it. I, I actually asked people if they would, I challenged them to do three things. If they, if they believe that uh, works are part of salvation, I say, okay, you got to repent of your sin, you got to stop sinning, you got to do good deeds and all this, and if faith, faith in Jesus is not sufficient, more is required, then tell me these things. One, did you stop sinning completely after you got saved? Have you stopped sinning 100%? Okay, question number one. Question number two. So if works are so important, I want you to list all the works that you do on a daily basis so I can judge whether you've done enough works. And then number three, uh, the verses that I'm going over here right now with you guys here, these verses and mothers, I said here's a list of clear verses. I want you to refute those verses because they say what you, you believe is wrong. So you're going to have to interpret and refute those verses uh, in order to uh, justify your, your doctrine. And uh, nobody was, has ever been able to do it. One person tried to do it, and she became converted and, and was so thankful because she understood. It was, uh, she, she failed, and she needed Jesus to re rely on him completely. So uh, it's the same kind of a thing now that I'm, I'm presenting here is that, look, here's the clear verses. These are irrefutable. Uh, and, and if anybody's watching now, and I, I, we do want you to send us all the verses that you are, uh, you you think say uh, contradict these verses, and if they do controverse contradict them, then we really have a problem because the Bible's contradicting itself. It's saying all these verses saying works are not required, and if you're going to send us verses that saying works are required, then the Bible cannot be counted upon because it's just a contradiction. Uh, so we, we say, no, it doesn't contradict itself. The, the controversial verses can be explained, and we're going to do that as we go along. But so far, we've, we've proven that there are many clear verses that say, one, you cannot mix faith and works. It has to be either works or faith. And number two, it, it's not by works because we just gave you numerous verses that said, not by works, not by works, not by works, not by works. Right? Okay. So now let's go to the next part, and it says now the question is, could it be by faith? And now we're going to read a few faith verses, and just tell me if this is clear or if it requires any interpretation. Look at John 1, 12 and 13. It says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It says right there, I underline this part, to them that believe on his name. Now, we notice one thing, is a couple of things are missing from that verse. Uh, it doesn't say re repent of your sins, and it doesn't say to do works. It simply says, to them that believe on his name. Believe on the name of Jesus. Okay? So... Mm -hmm. What can be said about that? I think it's it's clear. I think that it's very important to equate faith and believing. Like I've heard a lot of the heretics on YouTube and stuff act like you know, well, faith is more than just believing or something like that. So can can we establish right now that faith and believing are the same with good reason? Yeah, I, I made a video, uh, believe defined. Uh, I took the word believe and defined it because. Uh, the uh, I was showing verses that said all you got to do is believe in Jesus, and then people would say, "Well, well, that depends on what you mean by believe." You know, <laughs> so as uh, this is about as as absurd as it gets that you're forced to actually define the word believe. So everyone, I hope everybody watched my video, believe defined. But summing it up, there are certain words that are uh, interchangeable and synonymous with believe in Jesus. Uh, that means to uh, we believe in his, we have faith in him. That means we believe in or have faith in his ability to save us and his faithfulness to save us. 
to believe on Jesus is interchangeable would be to depend on Jesus or rely upon Jesus to save us. These are words that are interchangeable, synonymous, but you will not find words like strive, surrender, follow, and serve. These words are not synonymous with the word believe or faith. There is a totally different meaning. Right, absolutely. Uh, another thing on that is uh, they love to put out the, the verse James 2.19, we're going to go to that later. We don't want to discuss their, their verses. They throw at us till later. We're going to hold those oh, okay. until the end. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're going to answer all the verses that you guys can think of, and anybody who sends us one, we're going to answer them. But I'm trying to lay this foundation first, so showing that, look, look at all the clear verses. Can you, you don't have an answer for these. these. These just say what they say. You don't have to interpret them. Why can't you put your faith in what's clear instead of what's controversial that everybody wants to argue over? That's the whole point I'm trying to make here. Okay. Now we'll go uh, to the next verse. It's uh, maybe you've heard this one. It's John 3:16. Uh, I'm going to start with 3:15 and uh, through 18. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent his Son not into the world um, to, uh, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. What comes to my mind here is that I don't see repent or works in here. I see believe, 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 and believe. Okay, what's your impression of that verse? One thing to throw out there is uh, I've noticed this. Everybody says that the, re the repent crowd, they always say repent of your sins. Uh, nowhere in the scriptures does it say that. It, it does say repent, but it never says repent of your sins. Now, I'm thinking if that was so important, wouldn't it have said repent of your sins? Or wouldn't it have at least been had one reference in there to saying repent of your sins? But it never does. It does say repent. I'm not. Don't get me wrong. It does say repent. But it never says to repent of your sins. Now, if it was, if it needed some clarity on that, I think, it, I think that somewhere in the verse, somewhere in the scriptures, it would say that. Because if it was so important, it would at least say somewhere, yeah, you must repent of your sins to be saved. But it, it never says that. It does say repent. But never to repent of your sins. Well, uh, repent no, comes. Man. I'm sorry. Go sorry, you it. go ahead, Wayne. Uh, well, repent uh, comes from the Greek word uh, get, uh, metanoia, which simply means to change direction, change have a change of mind. Um, that when you believe on Jesus, that's exactly what's happening. So I believe that's what repentance really is, and I believe all the turning from sin and the works, that's going to be a fruit, not a root. I believe that the works and the and the, uh, and the the freedom from sin that, that Paul talks about in Romans, that's, a, that's an overflow from God's grace. It's an overflow from, from who God is making us, but it's not something that we are effort, doing with effort. It's something that it's kind of like it's effortless change from the Spirit of God changing us from the inside out kind of like when we when we change diets like I recently have um, you you start to change from the inside out there's a little bit more glow a little bit better complexion and all this instead of having to put the makeup on top and letting all that poison get into your body uh, it's from the inside out and then, and that's the only healthy way to do it mm -hmm. yeah good point uh, yeah. I want I want was that Jackson or Austin that made the point about repent but whoever said it I want you to that was keep awesome. this in mind. Okay, keep this in mind. Uh, in the entire Gospel of John, the word believe appears in the KJV. It, it appears 99 times. How many times do you think the word repent uh, appears in the Gospel of John? Zero. It's zero. Zero times. So uh, now let's look at Paul. All of Paul's writings. 12, 13 books, if you accept Hebrews as Paul's. I, but everything Paul ever wrote, you find the word repent one time. 
And and in that case, Tanya, you know what he was referring to when Paul said he repented? He did not repent. Uh, oh, okay. Belief? No. Paul wrote a letter to a church and said, that letter I sent you last time, I know I was hard on you, but I don't repent on it. I repent over it because I oh, you, wow. you, you needed it. So Paul, Paul said he, would, he didn't re repent over the harshness of the first letter. Okay. Other than that, the Apostle Paul never wrote the word repent. The Apostle John never wrote the word repent. So now if uh, they only said belief and faith, so uh, we would have to conclude that the Apostle John and Paul were negligent saying that salvation comes simply by believing and having faith, uh, and, and they were negligent by not incorporating faith and works into I mean, uh, repent and works into it, if repenting of sins was required. Mm -hmm. okay. do, you, do you have that verse, Brother Luke? Uh, no, but Tanya will find it for you. Just, just uh, do a, a search for the word repent, and when, it, when you get into Paul's letters, it, you'll see it's one time. I forgot what it was, but... It's it's I the beginning. It up real quick. It's the beginning, like you know, like you got First Corinthians and Second Corinthians. I think it's probably the first few verses of Second Corinthians because he sent him a tough letter, and then the second letter he he said that. Yeah. Okay. Can I also just quickly add too the thing about John specifically, unlike unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it has a statement in here. I, I, I should probably should find the exact verse, but where he says, "These things have I written that you may believe on the Son, and in his in his um, and and believing in his name have everlasting life or be saved." Let me let me try to find well, that uh, word. That's uh, first I've got John it. Five thirteen. I no, it's not First John. It's in I, the, the the Gospel of John. Jackson, here it is. I, I've got it in my notes. We're going to cover that in a little bit, but let, we'll jump ahead to it now. John twenty thirty one, and this is John at the end of the letter saying why he wrote the letter. And John says the re reason he wrote this letter is this. He says, "But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing." ye might have life through his name. So in this, after John's concluding his gospel, he says, this is the real reason for writing this, so that you can have life through his name by believing in him. That was the whole point of it. So John's book, Gospel, was written as a message of uh, how to get eternal life through faith in Jesus. All right. Uh, so now we're going to go to John 3.36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Again, we have this word believe used. Uh, so again, John says if you believe, you have life. If you don't believe, you don't have life. But he didn't mention works or repenting of sins. Now, one thing about this verse, though, is that in the modern translations, it doesn't say believeth not. It says does not obey the Son. And I think I can see how if somebody was, was using a modern translation, they might this one might not be as clear of a verse, if that makes sense. Because yeah, I remember yeah. people trying to teach their heresy with it a, few, a year ago. So. That's, that's correct. Is that just NIV or or is it all NASB and all the others? Um, it was in my my revised stand, which I'll guess I'll go on the record. My favorite uh, modern translation is the RSV, and I I was using an RSV at the time, and it says does not obey in that. I'm going to look up on Bible Hub to see how many of them actually do. Yeah, so. that'd be a good. That's a good point to make, and and you know. Uh, I don't think any of us on the panel are KJV only. Uh, if you are, you can speak out for that. But uh, I was one of the staunchest KJV only for many years, and then I repented of that. And I, I believe now, I love the KJV. I always read it first, but I like to look at the others to compare them. Uh, but the, I, in other videos, I've talked about verses in the KJV there. Are, are not as desirable as a modern translation and then there are many other examples we can give making the other point that like this one here that uh, uh, um, Jackson's pointing out in the modern translations it gives you a totally wrong message it's not saying believe it's saying obey and so uh, uh, 
Right. Now, in defense, there's another point, and we might get into this later, so I'll, I, I'm not going to say too much about this, but there's another point that could be made where it says in some points where Paul talks about obeying the gospel as a clear reference to actually believing it. So I guess in this verse you could take it that way if you're reading a modern translation, but I still think yeah, it's confusing and don't like it here. Yeah, if, if you're going to use the, the RSV or whatever it is, whatever translation that says obey instead of believe, uh, then it opens up a can of worms and it forces me to explain to someone, well, what does it mean to obey, uh, obey uh, in this case, it's obeying Jesus about what he said you needed to do, which is uh, believe in him. He said the work of God is this, to believe in the one God has sent. So, uh, yeah, it, it makes you jump through extra hoops to answer that if you have that uh, a translation that I think misstates it. Um, all right, unless we're going to need to go further on that verse, I'll go to the next one. John, I stick yeah, go sorry, ahead. I, I, I didn't want to be the sour apple or anything. I'm a, I, I, I stick to KJV only. Okay, you're not, uh, you're not wrong in that. There's no right or wrong as far as I'm concerned on that. But, but uh, uh, okay, let's go to John 6:40, and this is the will of Him that sent me, that everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. So it says, seeth the Son, and believeth on him. Now, is this clear, or is there any, anything confusing in this verse? This verse just holds a lot to add on to, Brother Luke, because uh, we can go to the book of Matthew, and uh, we know that he says you do, uh, Christ is saying, you not do the will of my Father. Uh, this answers a question. Uh, John 6.40 answers the question of what is the will. But I also like to add on to John 6.40 that eternal security is also part of the will. And uh, this is, I don't know if we're going to touch on it. Did you want to touch on eternal security right now? Because I know that no, John we, 6.40... No, I don't want to go into that. We're going we're gonna to answer just uh, works to get saved, and then later we're going to take on any challenges about how you, that you could possibly lose your salvation in the second part. Okay, because John 640 also holds to a uh, eternal security, so I was just going to say that. Okay, uh, now we got John 647. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Okay, uh, is, there, is there possible to have any verse that's plainer than that? No. Nope, Jack Smack's favorite verse. Mm-hmm. But can I say one quick comment about 39 that you just talked about? Mm -hmm. yep. The one thing I could talk about this verse, and maybe, maybe since this requires going to another verse, maybe this isn't actually relevant, but since it says, seeth the Son, what if somebody went to Hebrews uh, and where it says, no, without holiness no one will see the Lord, and say, see, seeing him is a requirement or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's why I said, does anybody see any potential problem? The only thing in that or verse, 40, I think, I mean, not 39. Yeah, uh, the only thing in this verse that someone could get confused about is, well, that everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. Well, personally, I've never seen him. Have you guys ever seen him? No. Okay. So uh, th th that could be a, a problem. Uh, we'd have to come up with an answer for that if, if, it, if someone says, well, you haven't seen him. Well, I say, well, have you seen him? Or who, how many of us have seen him? Uh, and then we have to go to the other verses that say, believe, like the next one, the, he that believeth on me hath the everlasting life. It doesn't mention seeing him. So um, uh, anybody want to say anything about that before I move on? Yeah, I, I want to apologize. I, I haven't seen him in a physical sense, but I wanted to say that I've seen things that would be considered uh, supernatural or things that have happened where it's unexplainable. So I did want to say that I, I haven't seen him physically, but I think we can all attest to we see something more or we've experienced something that is almost unexplainable to where that's where we've seen him. And this is not necessarily to prove anything or prove a doctor or anything. This is just like a faith thing. But I think that all believers will have that moment, any moment, small, large, big, more than once. But uh, they'll have that time when they can say that what happened was unexplainable and then that was the sign or they saw through that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, go ahead, brother. 
Well, if, if Christ is in us, then all of us have seen Christ. Uh, we've seen his work in us. Um, Christ, it's no longer us. I mean, obviously, we're not Christ. But what I mean is when, Jesus, when, when God, when the Father sees us, he sees the righteousness of Christ. And so just, just based upon who we are, and we are in Christ. We are co-heirs, joint heirs with Christ. And so, when you and not not saying that I am Christ literally, but when you've seen uh, when you've seen a born again believer, you have seen Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, I would ask you to consider uh, the resurrection. J Jesus appeared, and um, Thomas was not there when they told him about it. Thomas says, uh, "I'm not going to believe that unless I see him and touch him." And then Jesus appeared again, and and Tom. Jesus said, uh, now that you've seen me, you believe. Uh, but blessed are those who have not seen me, and yet they believe. So, and this is another just clear example that uh, not seeing him is, uh, seeing him is not a requirement, because uh, except for those that lived at that time, the rest of us didn't get a chance to see him. But he says, you, even though you haven't seen us, you believed in me. So that's what he values trusting him even though we haven't seen him. See him. There's another point I want to ask about, um, and that is, there's a, is there a difference uh, between believing in and believing on uh, Jesus? The, the way I see it is believing in Jesus is like believing in his ability to save us and believing in his faithfulness to save us. Uh, and believing on Jesus is like uh, depending on Jesus and relying on Jesus to save us. It's the same kind of idea, but that's how I would make the difference between believing in or on. I've always thought that believing in is like a uh, is more of like just believing that something exists. Like if I ask someone, "Do you believe in ghosts or in Bigfoot?" the answer would be yes or no. That doesn't mean that they're relying on ghosts or Bigfoot to do anything for them. So I agree with your your uh, your part about believe on is believe in. I guess I never thought of it as deeply as per perhaps you just said that it's actually well, believing in his me, ability so let me let me use you in a, as an example Jackson okay you live in Colorado right what, if you told me that you have a car and it runs well and you have money for gas and that you you are going to come over here and pick me up and, and give me a ride and we're going to go to California together and and I say okay, okay Jackson uh, I, I believe in you uh, in other words, I, I'm, a, I'm believing in your ability to, to do what you said. Right. And I'm believing in your faithfulness that I can count on you to do what you said. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's where I see believing in. Believing in someone means you believe in them. You can count. You you have faith in them. You're you know you you trust them. You can count on them. Right. I like that better. I was just throwing it out there as to what yeah, I. Yeah, I can I can see your point though. That's what I was going to put out is trust. That's the key thing in that is the belief, faith, and trust all mean the same, but in the in this sense, when we believe on Christ, we're trusting Him to save us. Okay, uh, let's go to uh, before I go on. I want to read this one more time, John six forty seven, because I don't know if it's ever been expressed any more plainly and simply than this. Jesus says, "Verily, verily," and that means emphatically, emphatically. I want you to understand this: He that believeth on me has everlasting life. So, um, believing on Jesus, trusting Him, depending on Him, believing in Him as your Savior, I mean, uh, that, that, that's all that's needed. He's just condensed it down to that one thing, believing on Him. Okay, we'll go to John 11, 25 and 27 through 27. Jesus said unto her, I think he's talking to uh, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? He saith, she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. So here you have talk, Jesus talking about believe, believe, believe over and over again. 
Let me also point out that Martha's response here, I think, destroys the idea behind this believe as some mystical uh, or, or some additional requirement or something. She just said, yes, I believe it. She didn't say, oh, I now commit my entire life to or something strange like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh well, so far these verses I, I've showed you are pointing out the simplicity uh, of the message of salvation, that it's, uh, it, it's not faith in works, and it's certainly not works, but it is faith or believing only. Uh, and now we go a couple more, I'll go real quickly, and then, then we'll uh, go to some uh, verses that you might want to uh, answer. Uh, John 20, uh, 20, 31, we discussed that earlier. John says, at the end of the gospel, he says, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. And John, 1 John 5, 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Okay, so we have all these verses that are clear, that are not uh, subject to all kinds of weird interpretations that just say believe, or faith, uh, and then now we go to the answer to the question of what exactly do you have to do to get saved. Acts 30, 31, Paul is asked, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Uh, the same kind of question was asked to Jesus in John 6, 28 and 29. The religious uh, Jews asked Jesus, What must we do? to do the works God requires. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So here we have the Apostle Paul and Jesus himself specifically ask what you, they must do. What work do you have to do? What must I do? And the answer in both cases by Jesus and Paul was the word believe. Okay, that's all. Now I would, I conclude that if anything besides believing in Jesus for your salvation was required, then, then Jesus was negligent. He should have told him everything that was required instead of just saying, believe in the one he has sent. If more than, more than faith was required, Paul was negligent by saying it's faith without, without the deeds of the law. If anything more than believing was required, then John was negligent by saying, uh, only believing and never mentioned repenting or anything else. Okay? So this is the foundation that I wanted to lay before, before we take on the task of answering the controversial verses that you guys have in store for us. I have a list of a few that I've thought of, and maybe some people are texting us message, verses right now and say, what about this verse? What about that verse? Uh, and that's why I thought it was important to lay down this foundation and first declare, look, if the sensible thing to do is get the truth from the clear verses that don't require interpretation, and then don't, don't uh, try to t get your truth from the, the verses that are confusing and controversial. So we'll try to explain those now, but before we go on, I'd like anybody's comment on what we've covered up to this point. I I think one more verse should be laid, uh, Brother Luke. Okay. There's many more we could add. I didn't. I didn't want to go on and on. I've, I've got dozens more. But if you think this one is so important, I want to hear it. Uh, it was just First uh, John five thirteen. I don't have it memorized, so you'll have to say it to me. It's these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son, that ye may know ye have eternal life. But oh, yeah, I, and I, I think this is a great verse and everything. I'm not sure I agree that it's one of the super clear ones, because it, some think it refers to John's entire letter, which I, which I disagree with. But, um, and, and so I remember I used to think, actually think this verse meant that maybe you did have to live up to some standard or something because of all the admonitions in uh, in First John. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have heard it said about John, the other verse, uh, but not uh, not the First John that take on it. Um, okay, well, well, these admonitions in First John that you you've uh, 
alluded to. Maybe these are some of the things that we'll be talking about as we go along. Okay, now, uh, you guys, uh, what do you think first about the idea uh, that I've presented so far that we should we should rest on the clear verses instead of trying to rest on the verses that everybody's struggling with. I definitely think we should do that, rest on the clear ones. And I would also encourage everyone to um, do this, and I know it's going to take a lot of work, haha, <laughs> work, get it, um, <laughs> to memorize these verses that we just talked about. I haven't even done it, but I'm just saying I'm, I think I should, and we should, because I think... If those of you in this room who have struggled with, you know, do I have, am I doing enough to be saved and all that, that fear that you went through. I don't recall a whole lot of people bringing these verses to me, and I think that if they would have, that um, it would have helped a lot. And so I think that we should memorize these so that when we encounter those legalist preacher types that we can bring these up, not not necessarily for them, because they're so hard-headed they, they don't listen most of the time, but the people who are around who see that, they'll see these verses, and it will help, you know? I, I think it's really a good idea. I, I've memorized most of them, even though a lot of them, I can't tell you the address, I can just say it, you know, I don't know, like, I do know, like, Romans 3.28. Uh, for example, and, and others, but sometimes I don't know the address. Uh, but you're, uh, I would recommend you not only memorize the verses, uh, if you see me doing street preaching in my videos, you see me reading sometimes, and as I read those scriptures, it's not because I didn't know the scripture. The reason I read them instead of just speaking them is because I wanted the people to know that I wasn't just talking off the top of my head. I'm reading scriptures. So I think it's it's great to memorize them, but I think if you have the, the little pocket Bible with you all the time, or me, I always have a notebook with me with all these verses out there, and I want to show them in writing so they can see it instead of just not hearing it. And then the best approach is not preach to them about it. Say, Sister Tanya, um, you know, I know that you're you're pretty knowledgeable about the Bible, so maybe you can help me with this. Um, um, would, would you tell me what this means? It, it, and let, I read it to you. I said, look, it says in um, uh, Romans 3.20, it says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Could you could you explain that to me? I, you know, I just play a little bit dumb and put put it on them, and it forces them to try to explain it to me, and there, there's no explaining. There's no, as I said, if you give them a clear verse like that, they, they're, they're stymied. <laughs> Brother Wayne, you look pretty uh, different. You look you look kind of menacing. Well, you know, I am a menace to uh, those legalist preachers. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Now, I have a number of other verses I'm not going to go over right now, but the verses that uh, that I'm saving are verses uh, that. Uh, are more specifically proving the point that you cannot lose your salvation. I'm saving those for later because I want to divide this into two, two uh, questions. The first question we're asking now is, uh, is, faith, uh, is faith required or is works required or is faith and works required? We pr I think we've proven that uh, you can't mix the two together. It has to either be faith or works. And then we showed a half dozen verses that specifically say, not by works, not by works, not by works. So we know it's not by works. And then we showed another eight or ten verses that say it is simply by believing. It's faith, 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 believe, believe, believe. Okay. So we've proven that case, I think. Uh, and then we'll go on and prove the case that you cannot lose your salvation later. But for now, let's look at any verses that anybody wants to bring to the table now and say, well, Somebody said that, that works are required in this verse. So let's see. It, take on the verse and see if we have an answer for it. Uh, who wants to bring a, the first verse to the table? I've got some. If you don't can't think of them, but I'm assuming you guys have some too. 
James something. It's in the book of James. James 2.19. Okay, you're gonna you're gonna read it. Is that the demons believe and tremble? That is correct. That's the one Austin was making reference to earlier. Okay. Uh, now I have my own answers to all of these, but I want to go last. I want everybody to have a chance to give your answers. Uh, so read the whole verse and, and explain why you, th you it, it, people say this is a problem for us. Who brought the verse to the table? You guys still there? Am I live with you? I'm, yeah. I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the answer too. Yeah. Well, hey, while they're looking that verse up, I've got one. Um, that okay. I looked up. This one always messed with me, and the legalists love to use it. It is Luke 13:24 that says, "Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able." Where is that? That's Luke 13:24. I'll post it here in the chat as well. Okay. Okay. Why is my chat like? Yeah, I um, since uh, about first of all, um, I have the James two nineteen here, but Tanya, the, I think who had a really good explanation for this verse was Bob Wilkin. If you look up Bob Wilkin's article on the Grace Evangelical Society's oh, okay. website, he says he actually thinks the striving here, and I agree with him because. First, he does a little Greek text analysis, and yes, it is. Strive does mean work really hard in this case, exegeti exegetically. That's how you say it here. But what's interesting is it says strive to enter by or enter in at the straight gate. In other words, I th what I think he what I think it's saying, if you really look at it carefully, is Jesus is saying since there are so many false ways out there and so many false plans of salvation, so many false religions, and and all that stuff to strive to find the one that's correct, but the comforting thing is for us as Christians, for us as, as faith alone Christians, should, should be redundant, but anyway, we've found the gate. We've found the narrow gate. So the striving to enter by is done because when we believe on Christ, we've entered through the narrow gate. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it really does. And, you know, like you were saying, gate. the gate is, is Christ. He's the door. He's that what we go through to get in. But with, so. with all the false uh, plans of salvation out there, there's no difficulty to me in saying to strive to find the correct one, if that makes right. sense, by searching the scripture. Yep, I totally agree. And I'll have to check out that sermon, Bob Wilkin. Yeah, it saying? actually wasn't a sermon. It was an article, a pretty old article from like 1990 or the late 80s by Bob Wilkin. Cause I, are you familiar with the Grace Evangelical Society? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Them. yeah. They they give out a free magazine if you want to subscribe to it. By the way, but yeah, oh, okay. he has an old magazine or journal article you can Google about Luke thirteen, uh, for twenty four. So, and I I really think he does a good job of nailing this one. Okay. Uh, I thought uh, that was a good answer. I have, as I said, I have opinions on all this, but I want to go last. I want you guys to give me your answers. And then I'll tell you if I agree with you or, or have a different answer of my own. So uh, Jackson uh, was saying that, uh, condense it into one sentence, Jackson. That the striving has to do with finding which is the true plan of salvation, not once you found it to gain salvation. Could you say that that's what we're doing at this moment and everybody watching and, and participating in this, they're striving to try to figure out what is, what is this narrow gate? Uh, a absolutely. I mean, except for the fact that I think that uh, us on this panel are already saved, so we've already found it. But the principle yeah. you're asking about definitely applies. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, but yeah, you're you're correct. Uh, uh, we all have gone through this this uh, gate, and uh, it's settled for us. But we're stri we're striving to teach them. But uh, people who are still seeking to find out well, what I need to do, uh, hopefully this message tonight. Uh, if they're seeking, they're going to find the truth here through this this uh, this discussion. 
Okay, uh, someone else have another answer, or is, does everybody agree with uh, Jackson's take on that? Right. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to go ahead, Wayne. Uh, in you know Luke 13, the the effort implied here is not for the purposes of earning salvation. Um, we know we just read about a billion scriptures about how it's a free gift, uh, but we do. It also says in First Timothy 6:12 to fight the good fight of faith. You know, faith in Jesus' goodness uh, is what saves us, not our own goodness. And Satan is is constantly trying to destroy our faith. Um, there's nothing he can do. It's a, Jesus said there's not that no man can pluck us out of his hands. Uh, but all, if we're confused, if we're you know if we're if we're doubting our faith, and then then that means we're not having victory in our lives. I believe this is talking about uh, fighting the good fight. I, I mean, I think it could be connected to First Timothy six twelve. Well, what does that say? It's the fight the good fight of faith. Okay. All right, uh, Tanya, uh, you satisfied with the answers? Or are you are we lacking? Nope, I think that's good. And what I put in the chat, the YouTube chat too, is uh, that the key is that Jesus is the gate, Jesus is the door. We enter eternal life by and through Him. And there are many who teach other gates, other doors, other ways to heaven. Because the verse says, you know, for I say unto you, or many, you know, will seek to enter, seek to enter in. Well, of course, even the works, salvationist people seek to enter heaven. I mean, the Muslims seek to enter heaven, but it says uh, they will not be able to, and that's because they do not believe in Christ. So, if you're listening, make sure you believe. Okay. All right. Uh, now let's uh, go on. Who wants to pr bring another a controversial, misunderstood verse to the table? Galatians. Uh, go for it. I was just going to say real fast, absolutely to Tanya's Luke 13:24 with the with the gate. Uh, Christ says in John 10:9, He is the door. Uh, another one is the narrow way. Uh, again, if we use the scriptures, we know that Christ is the way in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So uh, both those are easily answered by just searching the scriptures. We know that he's the way, the door. So therefore, if, if, again, if we have a confusing scripture, to the best thing to do is just use the scriptures to answer the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Okay, brother. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, who's going to go with, present another uh Verse for us to discuss. Uh, Galatians five four says, um, it, "It's kind of it, it can confuse some people." I, I preached about this sermon this past Sunday. I, I taught on it. Um, for five, Galatians five four says, and I'm reading out a New Living Translation. So whatever. Uh, for if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. And uh, basically, some uh, you hear it all the time. People saying being the people are falling from grace, and uh, anyway, that's one that I'd like to hear what people, your opinions are on that scripture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that was a verse that I used as a, as a proof text for our uh, our. Uh, um, oh, was that one that you used? I don't... We use the, we use that as a proof text, but on at the end of it, you fallen from grace. Uh, that is yeah. also a potential problem, even though I used it as a proof text because I thought right, was... yeah, and that's why I wanted to bring it. I knew, I thought maybe subconsciously somebody in here said it, but yeah. um, no, you I know, knew that, I knew that there was a, a, a problem with that. I thought someone might bring that up even while I was discussing it, but I, I have my opinion. But I, I'm going to go last. Who's going to answer answer Wayne first? You guys still there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here too. Brother Wayne says they've fallen from grace. So what does that mean? Well, in this context, I think it clearly means that they're not teaching grace anymore. I don't know how you could read through the whole book of Galatians and, uh, and come to a different conclusion than that. Because it's all about what they're teaching and Paul is rebuking them and everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
So you're saying then it's not it's not talking about what someone uh, believes, but the the false teachings that are going on, and and that's what the primary message of uh, of Galatians uh, is that uh, Paul's saying, hey, I told you it's faith, and now you guys are adding Judaism in, and you stop it. I, this just simply it's simply believe it's it's grace it's faith it's not works don't try, try to mix uh, Jewish laws in with this and, and that false teaching came into the church and Paul was trying to make sure that uh, the, the message of salvation was not ruined uh, and that's really what Galatians is all about so you're saying it's about the false teachings okay anybody else have an opinion on that yeah, I'm sitting here looking at at it a little bit. Uh, I see verse six, so Galatians five six that says, "For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which w worketh by love." So you have it talking about faith, and then the very next verse says, "Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth?" So it looks like, you know, we have faith here and we have obey here, but obey what? The truth. And what's the truth? Christ. Yeah. So. The, well, I see the truth as, as not only Christ, but, but as the, the true message of salvation, uh, which right. is yeah. faith in Jesus. Um, okay, so we got, uh, I've always taught this verse as, even though, uh, Jackson is correct about the context uh, of the, the subject of the chapter and the, and the, and the whole book. Uh, but Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law. Um, I think he's making the point that if, if you are teaching that uh, you get justified by the law, then you do not get the grace. You've fallen from grace. In other words, it's not like... Uh, it's not like I had grace and now I lost it. Grace is there for me and I'm reaching for it, but because I'm trying to be justified by the law, I'm falling. I can't get the grace. It's, yeah. it's not available to me uh, because because I'm trying to incorporate the law and therefore it's as frustrated or nullified as he said also. Okay, uh, anybody else want to say that before we go on take on another verse? Yeah, has anybody ever heard of the thing you'd be, uh, it's kind of like a, a hateful word. They say that we cherry pick verses. Well, people cherry pick that one all the time. Right, but they, 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 they call us cherry pickers. Uh, one thing I can say to that, as Tanya just proved, is that uh, one time, the, the usually the people that are called cherry pickers aren't confusing, but the ones that say that, they leave a verse like Galatians 5.4 out. Uh, like Tanya proved, if we just move just slightly ahead of it and stop taking confusing verses out of context, as she said in Galatians 5.6, it answered that question. So I think uh, if we're reading something confusing, it's not in every case, but in most cases, uh, they cherry pick the confusing verses. And if you just keep reading and not take it out of context, you'll, you'll answer your own question, as she just did. It, in a way, it sounds to me like you're uh, stating that Tanya is brilliant. That, yeah, I, I think that's that. what he's saying. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought the same thing because she did make that point that uh, many times you'll find the answer to the problem in the preceding or following verses. So if you if you look in context, uh, uh, I did this uh, video recently on uh, wasn't the parable of the sower. It, uh, yeah, it was Matthew. It was it's Matthew chapter seven. That that whole all the problems in there. I we'll probably be discussing that. But I, I did a whole video on that whole chapter recently, and just showed that look, if you just go ahead, you'll find out the whole content context of the whole sub uh, subject, and and then it'll make sense. But if you just pull one verse out of context, you could have a real false doctrine come up. You know. Uh, all right, now we've we've brought up several verses, but the first verse was James. So let's go back to what whoever brought up James. Read the problem verse to us, and then we'll discuss it. I think it was Brother Jackson. Uh, yeah, I was you, uh, Brother Austin made a reference to this verse, and I happened to be the one who 
remembered the reference. It's James 2.19, which reads, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. And so sometimes they'll call faith alone devil faith or something because they with this verse in reference, or demon faith. Okay. All, All right. right. And with this, that's what I just wanted to tell you, uh, Brother Luke, was that my answer to the belief thing is to answer this. Uh, trust. That we trust Christ for salvation, while as their belief consists of a uh, knowing, a factual evidence, but they don't trust him for salvation. So that was the difference of what I was trying to make earlier, is that belief, faith, and trust, or belief and facts. There, there could be a difference in belief, but our belief consists of a solid-based faith and trust, while their belief consists of solid facts or unsaving belief. Yeah, I, I, we discussed this, uh, I think, on our last uh, hangout. You brought that up. I thought it was a very good uh, uh, addition to what, the way I always looked at it. Uh, and it, it's a very good answer to the, uh, the, the, the problem that I've been uh, posing for several years now on YouTube, and that is that, that uh, uh, mental assent to facts is, is not what uh, God wants from us. Uh, uh, I, I can think of a group of people that's probably about one billion strong. And in this group, uh, probably every single member of this group believes that there's one God, and they even believe in the, the tri triunity of God. They believe Jesus is the Son of God. They believe he died for our sins. They believe that he ro rose from the dead. Uh, they believe all those facts. They've got the facts straight. Uh, but I, I don't believe that there's very many of them of all who, who uh, are saved even though they believe the facts. Because if you ask them, why should God let you into heaven? What are you basing your salvation on and what, what grounds? And they are, they're going to say, because I, uh, I went to confession, I went to communion, I went to church, I lit the candles, I, I, I prayed, I tried to be a good person, and I got my fingers crossed hoping I'm good enough. They're just like the person in, in uh, Matthew um, 7 that was pure to Jesus and said, Lord, Lord, look at all the wonderful works I did in your name. See, these people never put their faith in Jesus. They put their faith in their performance, their ability to perform their religion. And uh, so that's what it means. That's the point you're making, I think, Austin, that they, they believed in God. Uh, and yet, in other words, they believed the facts about God or something, but, but and yet they never trusted and relied upon, upon him. Um, I think that's a very good, very good point, and it may be valid in this case, but the way I've always looked at this particular verse is that it's not even talking about Jesus. Have you ever met anybody that uh, says, uh, well, you know, you, um, you don't have to be a Christian. You know, I believe in God. That's all that matters. And, and the, that's the person that may be applied to in this case where it says, well, you believe in God. Well, even the demons believe in God, and yet they tremble. Believing that God exists is, is not enough. You've got to believe who he is and, and that you need him, Jesus Christ, to be your savior. <laughs> so believing in God in some generic sen sense in his existence is not enough. I've always looked at the verse that way. But the way Austin presented this, I think that all uh, uh, it, it is also helpful to understand that too. Yeah, I, I'm going to attempt to pull off a Tanya here. And at, if you go to verse 18, right before it, it says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you, I will show thee my faith by my works. So it seems to me the scope in mind here is the eyes of the human being and not of God necessarily. And then when it goes on to say, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. See, I, I, there are so many people who I don't think you can reach if you just say, I have faith, I have faith, I have faith all day, even if you actually do. I think, you know, outreaches like helping the poor and everything is what helps people see faith and everything. And I really think the fact that it says, yea, a man may say, is really key to this verse. Yeah. Yes. I agree, and also, you know, James chapter 2 is a ve very hard chapter. Um, 
it took me many years of, I think, maturing to be able to read this chapter without freaking out. And now I can finally do it. But I wanted to, um, this, this whole chapter is talking about how we're supposed to treat people. And I wanted to read this verse. It's verse 16 from chapter 2. And it says, and this is the whole point that, um, okay, and it says, and if one of you say unto them, he's talking about, uh, okay, let me go back one. It says, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doeth it profit? So to rephrase that, the brother or sister was naked and hungry. They, they needed food. And you said to them, Oh, go in peace and be warmed and filled. But you didn't give them anything. You just said, Oh, go, go on, you'll be okay. <laughs> And the question at the end was, what does that profit? So works actually profit because they help people and they show that we have faith. It's not that we're saved by it. It's that we're, we, we show people our faith by what we do. Yeah, while, we're, while we're on this, the next verse, of course, is uh, faith without works is dead, which is in the same area. So uh, I think that's what you're alluding to, Tanya. Let's just bring that right to the table at the same time. Uh, so it says, even the day of, uh, demons believe, and yet they tremble. So believing is not enough. And now it says faith without that. works is dead. And, and Tanya made a good point about uh, the works. What happened to Wayne, though? He was just going to say something. Now he disappeared. Oh, he, he said he had to go. Oh, he, what did he say? I thought he said, uh, he said uh, I've got one. No, he waved and he said, I, I have to run. Oh, okay. I think something came up. All right. Okay. Um, doggone it. I was going to just use him as an example, but I guess I'll use him. I'm going to talk behind his back now. Wow. Okay. Well, who else is going to uh, expound on this before I, I get into it? Yes, absolutely, on the book of James. Uh, I like how it also references old-time salvation. Uh, who would have thought in the book of James it shows simple belief? And it's actually in James 2, that towards the end. Uh, I also think this was kind of key, how he puts this in uh, uh, James 2, 22. Towards the end he says, seest thou, hath, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? He's referencing almost like his faith was counted towards a work. And then he says in uh, James 2.23, And the scripture was fulfilled with, saith, Abraham believed God. And we know that he's saying in, in this sense, like he trusted God. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So we also see that this in the book of James, even in the book of James at the last part, it's referencing old time salvation by simple belief, and then and then his record, his sinful record, was imputed with the righteousness of God, and he was called the friend of God. Now I also know that when it says the friend of God, this was also a reference to earlier on. Uh, I don't have the verse, but it's when Christ says, "I don't call you apostles, disciples; I call ye friends." Well, we know that since Jesus is God. It's almost like the same verse again. Uh, God is saying he's not calling us disciples or apostles. He's calling us friends. I think that that was another reference to that when, when Christ was saying, I don't call you this or this. So I'm going to find that verse. But it, what, he, what he was saying was, I don't call you this. I call you friends. When we know that in uh, even in the old time, Old Testament with Abraham, he said the same thing. And when the scripture was fulfilled with saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So we know that uh, by accepting the simple belief, uh, faith alone gospel, we become friends of God for doing so. And uh, I just want to put that in the book of James. Even in the most hardened part of the Bible, I would say, is uh, you know a simple faith alone, believe alone example verse. But I just want to put that out there. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I think uh, Jackson brought up the problem, but he didn't. Pro he didn't offer a solution, did he? Yet, Jackson. Which problem? Uh, in the book of James, uh, the, chapter two. 
oh, well, yeah, you're right. I did just focus on one aspect of the perspective. But, like, I'm a little bit, uh, little bit confused as to what it says about can this can faith save him in verse 14. I know that, um, and this is the, this is the interpretation I would lean toward. I'm not 100 percent sure of this, but I bought a commentary written by Zane Hodges on James. Actually, They're not real expensive at all, and you can get it on Amazon. But he actually thinks this save is a reference to temporal deliverance and not eternal salvation. In other words, because other places in James he references it says save like from disease and stuff, whereas disease dies and stuff like that. And so he holds what's called the temporal deliverance view of this of this scripture, and a lot of I think a lot of the rest of it falls in place if you take that view. Uh, to offer one alternative, though, Hank Lindstrom thinks it's talking about save from shame at the judgment seat of Christ or something like that. But I I, I I'm not entirely sure. But either of those are certainly. Uh, Certainly, answers to the idea that it's actually saying to go to heaven, you have to do good works. So, well, I want to say that I'm I'm uh, disappointed that Brother Mitch could not be with us tonight. I know he wants to be in these uh, every chance he gets, so there must be some good reason he couldn't make it. But I, I've had he's made numerous videos on this. I've had I've talked to him for hours and hours about James, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit of what. Mitch would say, and then and then what I would say about this, um, Mitch th sees James as a as a perfect rabbi. Uh, if, if if you were go to go to a synagogue today and and listen to rabbi's teachings, uh, he'd say James would be a you know ideal rabbi, um, and uh, he really except for uh, maybe one or two minor references to. To grace and salvation, there's really not uh, not much in the book of James about it. It's, it seems to be totally about something else. And so uh, uh, he's uh, Mitch has had a problem with it. At one point, he used to teach that uh, Martin Luther put a a divider when he made the Bible, uh, dividing after um, uh, after Philemon, there was a divider saying everything after Philemon. He was questioning whether it should be canonical or not, because you know when they debated over which book should be in the canon, you know uh, there are some books that were rejected, and then some were put. Uh, the, the, whatever was agreed upon, even some of those were highly disputed, and that's why Martin Luther put a divider after Philemon. Uh, so uh, Brother Mitch has always been. Uh, uh, I had a problem with James because he says that James clearly contradicts Paul. And that's why mm -hmm. I asked in the early on in this, we're going to have to answer this question. Does the Bible contradict itself? Here I showed you dozens of verses that say that it's only faith, no works. And then now we get to James and it seems to say something else. So uh, Brother Mesh says, well, there's this, these are contradictions. How do you, so, uh, uh, he's the way I see it you now. Uh, you know, brother, uh, uh, brother Wayne that just left is a pastor. Uh, I'm not a pastor. I'm an evangelist. What what would be, if you had to define the, a pastor and evangelist? Anybody want to take a stab at def definitions? Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, brother Jackson. Okay, sure. An evangelist is somebody who is like the sower, tries to convert people, tries to give them, or better word than convert, tries to get them saved. And a pastor is for helping somebody get, um, like, like grow in the faith and everything, and help them in their Christian walk, if that makes sense. Now, it's not that these two duties can never overlap. I've certainly grown a lot from Luke's videos and everything, but that's just not his primary purpose, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, does anybody disagree with his definition? Okay. Nope. I, I think that... Is someone saying something? I, I was just saying... Uh... Christ was taught as a, a, a called rabbi. A rabbi is also a teacher, so in a sense, uh, evangelism and pastors are also known as teachers because they both teach. They have to teach somebody the word of God for them to understand it. Yeah. Okay. You know, there's a lot of ologies in the Bible, right? 
You got soter soteriology. Ology means study of. Soteriology means the study of salvation. Uh, eschatology. It means the study of end times. There's other ologies. I don't remember them all, but there, there's all these different uh, subgroups of what we study in, in the broad thing called theology. And um, I've spent most of my life studying soteriology because I'm an evangelist. Uh, I made a video and said basically compared uh, evangelism and pastoring to, to a medical profession. In other words, an evangelist is like uh, uh, what's the type of doctor that helps a woman give birth when she gets pregnant and gives her birth? A pediatrician? I thought that was for kids. A pediatrician's for kids. Okay, what is it? What, what, uh, the doctor that Obst specializes in child? Obstetrician? Obstetrician, yeah, okay. There you go. So an evangelist is like an obstetrician. An obstetrician is to try to bring something to birth, okay? And, and that's what an evangelist. We're trying to give, bring someone to this new birth. Uh, and then after that, the obstetrician is gone from that person, and they go on to a, their, met, their physician. And that physician is there for the rest of their life to help them, give them the medicine and give them the advice so they can have good health and grow into a healthy person. And that's the difference between an evangelist and a pastor. A pastor's responsibility is much broader, even though pastors sometimes do, they should do some evangelism, but they've got a congregation called their flock, and it's their responsibility to help them grow and mature as Christians. Whereas me, I, want to, I want, mainly want someone to understand how to get saved, and then after that, to get with a pastor who can help them grow. So uh, I see, the, the way I see uh, Paul is an evangelist, and the way I see James is a pastor. James never left Jerusalem. Paul traveled all over the known world uh, as a missionary, setting up churches and being an evangelist, getting people saved, and then writing letters to, back to the churches and making sure their doctrine was correct. But So um, Paul... Uh, Paul's focus was, was really, uh, he didn't stay in one place and like be the head of a church the way John did or, or James. James stayed in Jerusalem. So James's main focus, uh, if his congregation was saved, I'm assuming that he had a saved congregation, a Jewish congregation that uh, was saved. Uh, and, and so he wanted to exhort them to grow and produce fruit and stuff and, and, and mature and be productive Christians. So that's why I don't see him talking much about getting saved because he had a saved congregation. And Paul's talking about uh, the, the other thing, getting saved. Uh, so that's how I see James, and that's the only way I can reconcile James to make sense to me. Uh, uh, otherwise, I might be tempted to do what some other people say, was let's just get rid of it, you know? So I have to ask, Luke, because I mean, you know, you know the the special connection that Mitch and I have, and everything. Are are you saying that Mitch actually thinks that James should not be in the Bible and is not not actually um, something we should follow? No, he did at one point, but I think he softened that over the last couple of years, and and now he believes that, yeah, it should be in the Bible, but it's just very misunderstood, and it's really uh, talking. It's not talking about. It's not a book for us to learn about salvation. Okay. I absolutely agree. It's very misunderstood, and I just recently started to understand it. It's it's not about salvation. Even that chapter we just read, yeah. uh, we're reading through. No. it's about um, you know, living your life and what you sh what you should do as let a Christian. Say, uh, after Tony, you know, let me say one last thing about about the difference between Paul and James. Uh, the I made a video comparing James and Romans 6, I think, where there's one, one chapter of Romans where Paul's talking about justified in God's sight. Uh, we're justified in God's sight by faith. James says uh, we're justified in man's sight by faith. Mm -hmm. This gets back to what Tanya or one of you mentioned earlier. This is about showing the world Look, I'm a Christian. You can see what I'm doing. I'm different. I'm producing. I want you to. to uh, it's a way of witnessing by doing good works. You know. Right. Uh, so, so James wants people to be justified. Like, to me, what justifies a person is their testimony. I ask someone, on what grounds should you go to heaven? And they say, Jesus is my savior. 
Well, that, that, that's all I need to hear. If I say, well, on what grounds are you going to heaven? And they say, well, I did all these works in his name. Then I'd say, wait a second, that's not salvation. That's, that's a false message there. You, you need to put your faith in the Savior. So to me, it's a person's testimony that, it, that I use to judge whether I think they're saved or not. But James seems to be saying that we, we, uh, we can tell by, their, by looking at them, their, by the way they're be conducting themselves, they're living their lives and their fruit and their works. Uh, and Paul says what's important is what being saved in God's sight, it's not works, it's faith. Yeah, I agree with that. And this, that made me think of another scripture, and I can't remember exactly where it was, but I looked into the scripture because I'm married to an unbeliever. He's an atheist, so that's interesting. But um, I struggled with that for a long time, and I remember reading uh, something that said about how, uh, I don't know if it said the wife or whatever, but I'm, I'm to show him Christ by the way I live. Mm -hmm. or whatever. Do you know what I'm talking about, Luke? You yeah. know that is? I, I, I think, don't know. Is it in Corinthians or verse. something? Yeah, I don't know that verse, but I think that's, uh, that's valid. It's, it's, it's biblical, and it's worthwhile. Uh, I've had people, some of the street preachers, you know, that I've worked with over the years, and they're always mocking people when they say uh, that I'm in, I do friendship evangelism. Acting like you don't go out and preach on the streets, you're not vocal about presenting the message. You just think that if you just try to be a good person, that that's that's all you need to see. But uh, I I think that this friendship relationship evangelism is also important because I've had people ask me over the years uh, when I used to be employed. Uh, sometimes people say, well, why is it, Luke? Every time I ask you how are you doing today, you say I'm fantastic. And I say, well, it's, it's because I'm saved. I'm going to go to heaven. I, you know, I, I'm just joyful knowing that, that Jesus is my Savior. See, see, they ask me the question because they've observed that I have this joy. And they ask me how I'm doing. I say, I'm fantastic, you know. So there is a place for that. And it, it, and it does serve a purpose. You guys still there? Amen. I agree. Oh, yeah. I, I, can't, I couldn't agree more, Luke. Um, I think the the idea that I, I mean because because I, I what how human beings work and this this isn't always rational but it's how they work is they won't listen to someone they don't like typically notice how like when people are debating oftentimes someone will talk about well I didn't like that guy's personality with what he said in his debate and they make the logic fallacy of throwing the baby out with the bathwater and all that stuff and what I've always understood James to be saying too is to understand the that the the human fallacy there and to not let that be a barrier because I I can see how as strange as as, as illogical as it is if somebody is acting inappropriately and then they say I'm a Christian and tell someone the gospel, they might they what they do is they associate that with that bad behavior and they might make them more inclined to reject the gospel. So exactly, Jackson, and that makes me think of what we just read in in James two. It was talking about if you see a brother or sister who is naked and needs food. Well, if you see some people who are like all about God and talk about God all the time, but they see somebody that's cold and hungry, and they don't help them. What are you going to think about their God? You know what I'm saying? You, you won't really be inclined to. You'll be like, ew, I don't know if I want that. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm a bit different, and this has to do with my Aspergers. Actually, I can. I'm pretty, pretty naturally disassociating of someone's emotions or behavior from what they're presenting or whatever. But I definitely think your point holds for almost all the population. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I think basically some of the comments you're making are supporting my, my premise that, that James is um, writing as a, from the heart of a pastor and Paul's writing from the heart of an evangelist. Absolutely, and we need pastors to teach people to be good, loving, empathetic people. We, we yeah. need that because it's important. Now, we, we always want to correct those people that say faith alone is, uh, is insufficient, you've got to have works. We, we want to refute that and defend faith alone, uh, but on the other hand, we don't want to uh, 
be accused of, and we don't want to be guilty of, acting like works are not important. Uh, we've made no, I know I've made a lot of videos and, and done hangouts talking about once you're saved, what do you do next? What, why should you do good works? Why should you try to you know grow and mature? And we've we've talked countless hours on those things. So uh, we, people sometimes want to accuse us of, of acting like works are not important, don't play any part at all. Uh, but the problem is there are some people that want to try to point the finger at everybody else and judge. Yeah, do they have enough works? And they're always comparing everybody's works. Uh, these people, most of the time, don't ever take a good look in the mirror. And even if they could answer my questions that I posed in my challenge video, uh, one, did you stop sinning completely? Two, uh, list all the works you do every day. Well, if they start listing their works, then I say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Doesn't it say, lest you should boast? And you're boasting. And it doesn't say, where's boasting then? You know, you're, 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 you're guilty of boasting about your works. And you know what? Even if you find someone that does do a lot of works, and I think everybody here, I think we all do a lot of works, but I don't want to be bragging about it, all the things that I'm doing, that you're doing. Guess what? Even if you think your works are great, you're going to always find someone that went on a mission uh, overseas and did more than you, and maybe their family was killed or they're killed or they got a disease, and they can come back and say, Hey, Tanya. You didn't do enough works. Look, I went on a mission. You didn't. So it, it, we don't want to get in this comparison and be find it. it's a horrible thing to be right. trying to compare each other, see who had enough works. I, I love this part. Uh, Jesus spoke on this. Uh, it fits, too. Uh, John uh, 8.15, uh, he's saying how he looks at us in a sense. And I always thought this was not to look at other people's characteristics, but I think that this is, you know, that's as God given, that's instinct. I think this is why he meant by this. And that was ye judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And I think that was basically what he was getting at was that you guys base each other's works or who did this and who did what. But I look at the heart. I look at the believer and I don't base his works compared to his works compared to his works. I base the believer to the believer. I think that we get so carried away by that, by our own pride, that we say, oh, I did more than him, or well, look at him doing all this stuff. Jesus simply states, ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And I think that's what he was meaning by that, was that you guys judge after these works. Yeah. And I look at the heart. Well, the best example I know in Scripture uh, is the Pharisee that said, Lord, Lord, I'm so glad I'm like, like these, this other man over here, you know. Uh, I give tithes, I fast, I do all this stuff. And, and then the other man just fell on his face and said, uh, God have mercy on me, a sinner. So this man is comparing himself to others, putting himself above others. And Jesus said, no, he's not justified. It's the one that just said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. He's the one that's justified. So uh, there's many people we know today. We encounter them every day on YouTube. These people that are trying to put, uh, compare themselves with everybody else and put and and uh, put them everybody under this uh, you know burden of showing your works. You know. Okay. Uh, listen, I think that I, I'd like to have these shows go two hours, uh, not too much longer than that. We've got probably a number of other episodes before we're going to be able to work our through all the the these of uh, controversial. Uh, that's the ch word I use to ch to describe these verses. Uh, controversial. People want to bring them up, and everybody argues about what they mean. But you know, we have these texts we gave in the beginning that are clear, concise, undisputable, and that we can rest on. So um, uh, I'm going to end the show here in a minute. Uh, I want everybody to make any final statement, and then we'll end the show, and then we can talk privately for a little bit uh, if you guys want. Uh, let's let's start who. Uh, we'll start with uh, uh, Austin. Uh, make any final remarks you want to make on what we've discussed so far. Uh, yeah, amen, Luke. I, uh, faith alone and Christ alone for salvation alone. And as we've clearly seen in this episode alone, that that's been proven time and time again. And again, just one thing, uh, just a reminder that if you guys are struggling or with a confusing verse or scripture, to, as Christ said, search the scriptures in John 5.39. If you're struggling with it, you need it answered, answer scripture with scripture because it's always there. Uh, thanks. God bless, guys. Okay. And uh, Brother Matthew? 
Well, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, sure. Okay, it, it's been acting up uh, Google Chrome all this time. <laughs> uh, but uh, a couple of things I'd like to make note of. I don't know if anyone has said any of this, so if they have, please stop me. Um, but um, in James chapter 2, uh, verse 19, where it says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. I've actually had a person come up and tell me, uh, you see, the devils believe, and they're not saved, so therefore, you know, it's not just belief. And what I like to ask them is, can you show me book, chapter, and verse where it says Jesus died for their sins? And uh, another thing I like to do is, for some people, when you don't know whether they're trusting fully in Christ or are they mixing it with works, I like to ask a person and say, if I see you across the road and I yell, hey, I want to talk to you for a second, and I run over across to you and I get hit by a car, and I'm flown back and forth, and finally I land right to your feet, and I say, tell me, right now I'm going to die don't call me an ambulance, I'm not going to make it in time, but tell me, what must I do to be saved? And, you know, from there, a person will actually try to tell you their way, their method of being saved, or you'll find out, do they truly believe the Bible salvation, which is uh, like what Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Good points, brother. Thank you. Brother Jackson? Uh, I would like to close by making the point, instead of just repeating the same point that Austin and Joshua just made, I'm going to make a point about logic, and that's the that's the, the the point that the majority is not always right. You know, I realize you might think it's kind of like like the free grace movement or whatever is some small sect or something, and what about these all these preachers with huge congregations that are not saying this and all that and everything. I would just really invite you to look at the passage in Matthew chapter 7 that says narrow is the way and few there be that find it and also to look at really what scripture says and not what the majority vote is saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good exhortation. Thank you, brother. And Tanya? Yes, I've enjoyed this very much, uh, especially the first part where we got those clear Bible verses in. And um, to those who might be watching late or joined late, like Jay. Hey, Jay. Um, uh, the, the verses that we said at the beginning, read them, know them, study them, not only for yourself, but so that you can show other people. I think that that would be a good idea. And I just wanted to say, um, you can... When people start to mix works with salvation, um, you know, Satan's very clever how he does that. You know, he'll talk about, oh, it's about faith and about faith, but you got to do this, you got to do that. He's very clever how he kind of works that in there. When you see people start to boast, that's when you can, that's kind of a red flag that you know that they're not quite right, like something's not right. So I just wanted to point that out. Keep an eye out for the boasting. Mm -hmm. So, okay. and I guess that's all. All right. Thank you, sister. Uh, all right. I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, I think we accomplished a lot, and I'm sure that you guys have already a list of other verses you want to discuss in the future episodes. I have a, a list also. So this may take some time to go over uh, many of these controversial verses, and uh, I think that we'll benefit by discussing them. But I, I want to reiterate what I said in the beginning, what Tanya just said here. Uh, if you're smart, you'll just accept the, what the clear verses we showed you in the beginning say. They, nobody's confused about those. They just mean what they mean. So just rest in those. And the other verses, we'll try to explain them the best we can. Uh, hopefully we can uh, put your mind at ease over these other verses. Now, if anybody's watching this and uh, you're not a, a Christian, then I'm going to tell you how to become a Christian. A, a, a Christian is any person who relies completely on Christ for their salvation. We're, we're not asking you to join a religion. Uh, we're not asking you to become a religious person. We're not asking you to follow some set of religious rules. We're asking you to put your faith in Jesus Christ completely. Reject the, the, the po any possibility that you can work your way to heaven based on your personal merit or your performance. Reject that. 
That's putting your faith in yourself. We're asking you to change your mind about believing that you can work your way to heaven and believe instead that you need Jesus. Depend on him for salvation, and he will give it to you as a free gift. It's really that simple. If you do that, I hope that you'll uh, make a comment. And if we see your comment, we will all just celebrate. And the angels will be rejoicing in heaven too. So uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.